All right, so hello, everybody. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming out tonight. And uh, there's this handful of things in our collection here at the Thomasville History Center that have just always kind of intrigued me, kind of filed them in the back of my head, never quite sure what to do with it. Um, there's a poem that someone wrote in the 1930s and that person was really angry that they didn't build the Atlantic Coast Line Railroad Interchange in Thomas. And so I kind of looked into it. And yeah, there was a lot of plans to build that interchange in Thomasville. Uh, but some of the plantation owners, um, also reasonably, because it would have been needed some of their land, uh, blocked it. And they built it in Waycross instead. Uh, which at the time, I understand why some people doing business in Thomasville were upset. Probably better off in 2024 that it didn't happen. Um, but that was always curious to me. Um, looking into the history of East Side School in 1914, they actually held a referendum about whether they were going to raise a bond to build East Side School. And if they didn't, there was a backup plan. And that backup plan was to by the recently closed Young's Female College on Dawson Street and have the elementary school over there. Uh, there are enlarged maps of what we might call Greater Megs and Greater Metcalf. Uh, if those cities were much larger. And a ongoing 40-year argument about whether or not to build a pavilion, a, a Rocho pavilion in Paradise Park. Um, obviously, we don't have it, but always intrigued. Like, okay, if they did, what would we have now? And the number one thing that has intrigued me is a uh, the story of both the La Cubana Cigar Factory and La Cubana City. Um, we all know Vashti School is in that big green square off Clay Street. And it's been there, I want to say, since 1908. It had moved from a smaller building uh, over on what today is like around the Cherry Street area. Um, but by 1908, this huge building was available over on Clay. And, okay, so what was up with La Cubana? Well, there's been a lot of good history done about it, so I started reading about it. Um, and then you start noticing some things as you look in other parts of the collection of, this could have been a real thing. So let's first take a look at what actually happened with La Cubana. There we go. So, just to be clear, the planned Cigar City in Tom, next to Thomasville, it failed. Uh, and it failed for a variety of reasons. It, it failed for, uh, number one, mismanagement. They didn't raise enough uh, funds to do everything they needed. And it involved some of the bigger names uh, in Thomasville and even in Southwest Georgia. So the two primary funders behind it were Archibald Thompson McIntyre Sr. and Thomas Cole Mitchell Sr. Uh, A.T. McIntyre Sr. was a planter uh, before the war. He was a lawyer who ran people's estates. Uh, and after the end of Reconstruction, he was the first uh, congressman to represent South Georgia. Uh, so he was a came from a large and at the time powerful family. Uh, and he both uh, sold land at a discount to the Thomasville Exchange Banking Company, which was the company behind La Cubana. Uh, and he did this together with T.C. Mitchell. Uh, T.C. Mitchell was best known for building the Mitchell House in downtown Thomasville. Uh, now, 
they weren't they were both older by this time um you know at mcintyre died by i want to say it was 1900 1901 tc mitchell passed away around the same time and it was two of their sons who did this and two of their more, more interesting sons they had several of them uh and it was really a gentleman down at the end uh daniel Irwin mcintyre the second youngest son of uh a.t mcintyre and william h mitchell one of the sons of tc mitchell um daniel Irwin mcintyre uh according to his nephew uh bill mcintyre uh you could still tell 60 years later he was feeling it uh was accused by bill mcintyre of blowing the family's fortune William H. Mitchell for Thomasville history readers, buffs, students. Uh, the name is most recognizable from what we call the Lucy Linton affair, where he was an accused kidnapper. Uh, for fans of true crime podcasts, there was recently one where he was accused of being the Atlanta Ripper. Uh, this was a few years later, but just to give you an idea of uh, at least uh, William H. Mitchell's reputation. Uh, both of them by 1895, uh, this started in 1893, by 1895, uh, both of them had pretty much left the business and sold it to Simon Steyerman. Simon Steyerman ran, at the time, a grocery store, and him and his brother had just opened a department store downtown. And so he was had a good, competent businessman, but never really, you know, every business is different. And uh, reading about the cigar business, the cigar business was really different. And so uh, it was somewhat, again, maybe less of mismanagement, but it was, uh, he didn't raise enough funds or didn't have enough funds on his own. Uh, and something more important happened. Now, these are the lands, by the way, that were given from the uh, deed record books by A.T. McIntyre and T.C. Mitchell to the Thomasville uh, Exchange and Banking Company. And that's sort of the road you see slashing through there. Uh, is uh, is um, Jackson Street. So here's the survey of La Cubana City. Uh, nothing about this is real, not even what really happened two years later. But to give you an idea of... Here is the uh, Thomasville Exchange Bank. Well, the original plan was... It was just going to head straight through all the ways down uh, to Jackson Street. And so at least that gave me a starting point to work with. Now, the surveyor and the plat uh, artist didn't do the greatest job, so I tried aligning things as best as possible. That large center square uh, between Del Pino Street, San Rafael Avenue, and Henry Clay Street East uh, is where Vashti is. But it also doesn't align because Clay Street in that bottom left corner kind of runs right into the corner of the block. Well, we know it's not like that. It runs straight by it. So even as they were building, they weren't even particularly following their own plans. Um, they meant to build an electric streetcar. And uh, that was a real important part of the plan. They kept on raising money. They kept on saying, we're doing it. And the electric streetcar never happened. And they needed it to get those cigars from the factory. We eventually were a couple small factories to the depot over on West Jackson Street. And it never happened. Uh, uh, it's on Clay Street, right across from the big park where uh, Fashtai is, 
with a little pond in front of it that was part of it being a power plant. Um, and obviously it's been a residential home for a long time. Uh, but there was, uh, there were successes. I mean, they do have that large building. There were other buildings. There were as many as maybe three dozen homes, casitas, as they called them, built uh, for workers to live. You could see all those, all those lots. They were planning for uh, really several thousand people living there and for it to be its own incorporated city. Uh, and people shop there. They went to church there. Places on Broad Street attracted them and did it. This picture uh, from 1894 on South Broad Street. A.W. Mahler sold it in a shop. It was called Uncle West's Pull Team. Uh, but aside from the architecture of the buildings, one part of it always really intrigued me also, which is the sign on Park's Clothing World, uh, Ropa Echa, uh, War Clothes. So even in that short time, they were already appealing for business from the recent Cuban immigrants that were coming in. Uh, and if that happened with maybe a couple hundred people, you can only imagine what would be needed for a few thousand. So by the end of 1894, there were probably around 200 to 300 uh, recent Cuban arrivals living in the La Cubana city area. Um, they went to, they went, to, they married, they had children, they built even more of the casitas. Uh, as you can see, they formed a baseball team to play against Thomasville's baseball team. Uh, the Presbyterians set up a Sunday school over there. Um, and this was all the granular things of what could have been a real city. Uh, there was one really big reason, though, on top of everything else why it didn't work, and that was the Cuban Revolution. All while this was going on, Jose Marti was uh, fighting against the Spanish government in, uh, that was the colonial rulers of Spain. And people were occasionally leaving Thomasville to go back uh, to participate in the revolution, take care of family. And we're going to take, uh, as we go on, Thomasville's never got had a big enough Cuban population to withstand those shift of people leaving. And so finding enough good qualified labor was one of the biggest problems. Basically by 1898, 1899, when the revolution at that point was like really, now it was into the Spanish-American War, uh, was in absolute full swing. And they basically just kind of gave up on uh, the uh, Thomasville uh, Exchange and Banking Company and the Cubana Cigar Company and the other small cigar companies were there. Now, uh, I'm not quite saying what I'm doing is a alternate history or a counterfactual history. Somewhere in between, uh, I don't know how many of you have ever read alternate history books or counterfactual history books. Uh, there's a lot of them. Uh, there's really only, you know, I mean, there's some really epic authors out there. Uh, Sterling, Harry Turtle Dove, like, cranks out 20 alternate history books a year. Um, but there's one that's always kind of uh, fascinated me. It was written in 1931 called If It Had Happened Otherwise. And it is a counterfactual history book written by uh, various English academics and other well-known people, including Winston Churchill, looking at some American and English and European history events. Uh, and as the title says, uh, if it had happened otherwise. And 
going through and like really it's an anthology of really well written medium length essays uh if you're ever up for a really interesting read but one of the tropes of uh doing this is you need a point of divergence where something different happens that makes and the one I'm going to take is a big one, which is there were constant news reports probably placed by the, by this uh, by this by Spain that Jose Marti was killed. And they actually went and this is July of 1895. They put out these fake reports so much it actually became a little bit of a running joke in the press. Uh, this came out like three days later in the Times Enterprise uh, about him being killed for the 11th teenth time. Um, but we're going to take it at face value and that Marty say that Marty was killed in 1895. And for the purpose of what we're doing, the revolution collapses. And now thousands if not tens of thousands of Cubans leave and depart for Florida and for our sake also southwest Georgia and they're looking for work and what this does for us is that it solves the problem of they're not being available labor uh, and now run by Simon Steyerman there's an ample workforce and they really start doing really well. So now what we're going to do is my best attempt to overlay. Uh, and by the way, here's a closer look at the uh, center of La Cubana City. Uh, Del Pino was named for Gaspar Del Pino. He was the actual president of the cigar running operations at the Cubana Cigar Factory. Uh, having the street that runs diagonal, that wide avenue is uh, San Rafael Avenue. Um, and then there's Henry Clay Street East, Henry Clay Street North. And then, as you'll see later, a bunch of tree named streets in the northern part. And then First Street and Ninth Street. Uh, so. Things don't align, align perfectly, but again, there's when they were planning to pack into an area where houses are well spaced out. So all of a sudden, you're talking about this highly populated area. They're going to need schools, and it was also deeply Catholic. So uh, I think after, say, getting a post office, then the uh, next thing they would have done was appeal to the Diocese of, of Savannah uh, to build a church. Now, St. Augustine did exist in Thomasville at the time, but it was one, a small church, and it was also still a seasonal church. Uh, and I think there's ample reason to believe that the diocese and even St. Augustine itself would have contributed to the building of a much larger church in the uh, center square uh, or the town square of La Cubana City, uh, which I'm just going to go ahead and call it uh, Our Lady of Charity. Catholic Church, uh, which is the patron saint of Cuba. Good reason to call it. There are a bunch of Our Lady of Charity churches out there uh, in Cuban communities in the U.S. Uh, but here's where it was doing well. They're talking about a town hall. and uh, It was, I'm not quite sure about that building that they talk about there. It was a three-story wood building, so it's not the factory. I did see an old picture, which kind of has a varnish-looking building behind it. Um, they make it sound like it was a reality, but I'm not sure that it became one. Um, 
So now back to our map. Now we're 1900. So the proposition is that Fondren Mitchell, who was the state representative from Thomas County at the time, uh, was supportive and submits the legislation to incorporate La Cubana City. Uh, one of the interesting things about Mitchell is that one of his cousins, uh, Walter Williams Jr., a few years prior to this was actually working in Havana and had married a young Cuban woman. And so there's even reasons to think for familial reasons uh, that Fondra and Mitchell would have been supported, obviously, and then other relations, uh, particularly with Archbald and Mitchell, uh, with a uh, with um, McIntyre and Mitchell would have uh, certainly led to this also. Um, and the other part would have been one of the main characters of Thomasville during the time, uh, Judge H.W. Hopkins. He was a real estate developer by then and developed a lot of uh, low cost housing for blue collar workers. And this would have been a absolute gold mine for Judge Hopkins, and I believe that been highly supportive of this effort also. Uh, now, we do have a little bit of a model to say how things might have happened, and so to look for that, I looked at Ybor City, uh, which it's not a mistake The people, you know, this is what inspired McIntyre and Mitchell was the success of you. Uh, and this is the oldest standing cigar factory there. Well, I wouldn't have looked at a place in uh, this area. It was a sort of standard factory type. And these ones would have maybe five, six, seven of them in a successful, basically, industrial area of La Cubana. Uh, all of those lots that you saw would have quickly sprang up. Some of them were really tiny that had casitas there, but a lot of them were slightly larger lots that would have had more of these two-story homes, which would have been for middle management, professional class, uh, business owners. That, again, you know, this isn't exactly heavily Cuban inspired or anything like that. It would have been right at home in Southwest Georgia. Um, I'm trying to wrap my head around a little bit of what La Cubana would look like, but it all would have gone up very quickly. And it would have, you would have had a lot of homes that looked extremely similar. They would have built the electric streetcar and it would have gone right down Clay Street to Jackson Street. And so a few years into it, this would have been something that you have seen that you could have seen now. That's sand, not snow, obviously. Um, but that's uh, now there's differences, uh, too, between what La Cabana City would have been and Four City. One of them. Of, you know, one or two thousand people when Ybor City formed. Thomasville was way more populated, way more developed, way more affluent and influential. So Tampa annexed basically Ybor City, or they merged two years by 1887, two years after Ybor City formed. I really don't think this would have happened uh, for cultural and religious reasons and just also uh, sort of uh, power reasons that people in positions of power wouldn't have wanted to give them up. I think that there's good reasons to think that uh, Thomasville would not have annexed uh, La Cubana City, but rather they would have developed side by side. Uh, and of course, this would have heavily impacted Thomasville, the uh, far eastern side of Thomasville uh, is right of of, of uh, Thomasville and La Cubana. They bordered basically Hansel Street, uh, right around there. 
So when East Side schools, school was built in 1914, well, they wouldn't have built it since it was like practically in La Cubana City. So not getting into other speculation, but well, where would they have built it then? Well, I'd speculate they'd build it at Young's Female College. Now, the passes and 1914, they demolished Young's. And that they demolished the Ephraim Ponder House and clear out the Bessie Merrill House and go ahead and build East Side School over on Dawson. Um, and it also would have had other effects on Thomas, especially when we get into uh, 1920 to 1930. So instead of this was the period when Glenwood popped up. Well, that's all La Cubana now. Instead, Thomasville would have expanded to the south and west a lot quicker, kind of like into the area where Vos Field or the Campbell Street Industrial Park is today, would have sort of been the next obvious spot for expansion and what's open over there. And would have developed a completely, you know, different commercial district going on over there. Uh, maybe something more along the lines of something uptown. La Cubana also would have developed two separate commercial districts. Obviously, downtown over by where the main city square is. But over here, and you can see again, these are much larger lots than you saw in the other part of the survey. And it's very close to Thomasville. Again, for context, Glen Fern Park is McIntyre Park, the lower half being where the schools are. Uh, this would have been really attractive for a lot of executives of La Cubana and a lot of the owners of larger businesses. But now they couldn't have built Thomasville High School where they did in 1925. Uh, so gaming it out, I think the obvious thing they would have done is built it on the Fletcherville School property, kind of like how when they built Harper School right next to a still standing Fletcherville School. And they were both standing. Fletcherville School stood next to Harper for about five years. Uh, so... I'd speculate that they would build the high school there and maybe one or two other schools there. So kind of like how McIntyre Park became this school block, I think this would have happened uh, over, in, over in the Fletcherville area and the Fletcherville school block, which is sort of what it was always intended for anyway. So, uh, But also it would have been a much more central part of town than with Thomasville's eastward that had happened at the time. Uh, the other thing I thought about was, um, what about the plantations and Archibald Memorial Hospital? Well, I don't think any of that changes. Uh, the plantation sales had already begun by then, by the time that La Cubana City started. None of this really affects any of the Red Hills land itself. And... I think uh, I think Archibald still builds uh, the hospital in the name of his uh, named for his father in the exact same place where it was built anyway, but now serving a much broader community, uh, also uh, for the residents of La Cubana City. Um, the other thing is for La Cubana City is they would have really needed to build school uh, and really sort of a big one. I think this also would have happened right around the central square, uh, somewhere maybe a little south of Henry Clay Street, east over there. Uh, maybe Lot 335 looked pretty good and accessible uh, for just about everyone where the blue star is. So again, going back into what would La Cubana City have looked like. Uh, these are the casitas. Um, 
looking at what they had, unfortunately, I've never seen a picture of the uh, small home homes that were built around uh, Vashtai. But again, this is architecture that would absolutely not be out of place in Thomasville and it would have gone up quickly. And you see the size of the lots and these would have been about the size of homes that could have fit on lots uh, that was planned out in the original La Cubana city plat. Now, 1930 to 1940 was obviously not good for everyone, really bad for the scar business, really bad for E. Borston. Uh, and there'd be no reason to think that La Cubana city would have escaped that. Uh, and I think it's safe to say that many of the cigar companies would have closed. Uh, there would have been some unemployment and also a lot of looking for uh, different industries to come into town. Uh, they did have a would have had a ready and willing workforce. I think something else is also happening by this time period. Now we're on to easily the second, maybe the third generation, which is how Cuban is La Cubana City still at this point? I mean, still is. You obviously still have people who might have been there for the jobs that might be as young as their 50s. Uh, probably had a lot of other people move out, though. Uh, and particularly with the SCAR companies closing, I don't think that it's crazy to suggest that it might have been losing its flavor a little bit. Uh, also looking at Ybor City in the years right around then, a little before, uh, there was a fairly large number of Italian immigrants that moved in there. And one of the reasons why they went to Tampa and Ybor City was there were there was a Catholic population there in churches. Uh, some of them moved from New Orleans after a riot. Some of them uh, came after World War I. I think some would have ended up in Ybor City, rather in, uh, in La Cubana City, rather than Ybor and Tampa. And thinking about it, uh, wouldn't have been crazy for there to even be a little Italy neighborhood in the La Cubana City, uh, given its well-established Catholic population. World War II and afterwards. Uh, well, again, I don't think this shakes up the big events of Thomasville that much. Uh, you know, I believe Flowers, you know, I believe Flowers is still operating bakery plant. Uh, I believe that during this time, the Sunnyland Packing Company still opens. Now, maybe exactly where they are changes up a little bit, but I don't see any reason for any of this to change or why there wouldn't still have been appeals for Finney General Hospital and the Army Air Base to move out here. Now, maybe it's not called the Thomasville Army Air Base. Maybe they go more for Thomas County. Um, but it, I think it's still generally these big events happen as they do. Uh, but then after the war, you have the baby game. And you have a lot of, you need new schools built. And a lot of people now that there is uh, automobile travel and uh, car culture is dominant, you don't necessarily need to live downtown. So the same thing happened that happened in Thomasville happens in La Cubana City, uh, which is you have a set of a westward expansion, you have an eastward expansion. Uh, the uh, US-19, the new one, was built in 1963, so where we're at, it's not even built. As it was, La Cubana was butting up against it. I think that La Cubana expands right through where US-19 would have been built. But I'm even going to go a step further than that. And... Uh, suggests that 
they end up building it to the west of Thomasville. I'm also going to guess that because of La Cubana's slightly more depressed economy, uh, even after the war, that they make the decision to join the county school system when it consolidates in 1958, that they give land, uh, maybe even the land that Central High School was originally built on, uh, for the consolidated county high school to be built and for uh, Magnolia to be built, except here, rather than uh, Magnolia, Black County Consolidated High School during the era of segregation. Uh, thus leading to Hickory High School rather than Magnolia. Now, back to uh, La Cubana City and US 19. Uh, I think Thomasville uh, would have lobbied very hard for US-19 not to go through La Cubana City uh, and that they would have wanted it running through Thomasville. Um, and I think they may have been successful. And so looking at it, basically where the West Bypass is would have been the route that US-19 takes. Uh, and then going north and sort of rejoining what the existing our timeline route is somewhere north of 202. And this also makes sense if Thomasville had continued to develop uh, westward. Uh, and it also eliminates the problem of there already being so much development in the route that US-19 today takes uh, in uh, what would have been Occupy City. Uh, going through uh, the 60s, I think that eventually La Cubana would have embraced the textile industry that was so big. Uh, there would have been, again, an ample trained labor force. And as it expanded, I think that would have been where La Cubana really succeeded, sort of in that area between, uh, you know, 319 and Pavo Road, uh, between Moultrie Road and Pavo Road, where it's all commercial land. I think that would have been where some of those textile factories would have popped up. And that, you know, La Cubana, it's not hard to imagine, could have done pretty well, maybe in response to Thomasville's Success with the Rose Show and Rose Festival. Well, they have that big wide San Rafael Street. So maybe they have the San Rafael Fest Festival on the third weekend of every October instead. But of course, the problem is, is a lot of this is happening in what are essentially the suburbs of Washington. And, uh, you know, A lot of decays like small towns all over America. And then there's the other existing problem, which is the tobacco industry in the U.S. Uh, probably by around 1980, the last cigar factory in La Cubana closes down, uh, which was, you know, I think would have been a more symbolic thing than actually something that seriously impacted the economy. Uh, because by now, there's all these textile mills operating. They're starting to dabble in tourism a little bit. Uh, this goes on to the mid-90s when the aftermath that really was felt throughout South Georgia and other parts of the South uh, after NAFTA was fully implemented in uh, it was 1995 when it was fully implemented. And textile plants closed down all over the place. And this would have really impacted La Cubana, which at this point had uh, a lot of its economy around then, which is then you have uh, 
La Cubana really thinking about tourism and thinking about its Cuban heritage, even if it wasn't necessarily ethnically that Cuban of a city anymore. Uh, landmarks still exist. They have their own hist They have their own history center. They have. Uh, they work with Thomasville on tourism, and I think they really lean into this. And there is absolutely north of Tampa. I'm not sure I can think of a, really quite anything like this that would have existed. Uh, and so by the time you're getting to 2000, maybe the last of the textile mill closes, but their downtown area is starting to rejuvenate. And by the time you get to the early mid to, you know, 2000s, they're really having a successful tourism industry. Uh, and it's this sort of unique on Cuban enclave. Uh, they are still an incorporated city. Uh, and maybe even by somewhere in 2010, someone goes ahead and opens their own uh, artisan cigar micro factory uh, hand rolling. Uh, Adel Pino cigars uh, for each customer who walks in. Uh, but maybe, maybe a little optimistic. I don't know, but. Even with everything that would have come down, I do think that the original Bona Cigar Factory would have made it. You're serving as Cubana City City Hall, maybe as a charter school for a period of time, and maybe even abandoned, and then uh, makes its grand return as luxury condos. Uh, in the uh, center of La Cubana, and everyone lives happily ever after. Uh, thank you, everyone. And if anyone would like to uh, nitpick or poke any holes in my story, I am completely ready. So.